For developing a conceptual model of interaction between the value chain and the environment, we differentiate between three basic correlations between the value chain and the environment. And energy questions are part of all three basic correlations. First, when you have a look at the left column, value chains often cause a negative impact on the environment. With any kind of production or transformation, we impact on the natural environment. We replace natural forest areas by farmland or increase greenhouse gas emissions by burning charcoal or petrol in processing or for the transport of goods. Usually, with increasing development of value chains, we may cause higher negative impact on the climate and the environment. And if the energy comes from unsustainable sources, we have a negative impact on the environment. The second correlation, the second column here in our slide, uh, is the other way around. Our value chain may be affected by climate change and environmental degradation. In terms of energy, this means that rising energy cost can be a result of degradation and increasing scarcity of resources, which reduces the competitiveness of the value chain. And for instance, rising prices of firewood or petrol would make our production more expensive. And the third correlation is a positive one. The value chain may contribute to compensating emissions and creating a green economy. For instance, the promotion of renewable energy, um, value chains such as solar energy or the promotion of environmentally friendly technologies would lead to reduced emissions and more sustainable use of energy. For assessing the correlation between value chains and the environment, we find it useful to have a look uh, at these three basic correlations and this is our starting point of any kind of environmental uh, assessment. Could you also maybe explain how you develop a conceptual model for environmental analysis? In all assessments, we would start from our value chain map. And you would see here at the left side the value chain functions, primary production, intermediary trade, processing, trade and consumption. And now we go one step further. We um, further detail the, technical func the functions into technical processes. For instance, if we have a look at primary production, for the environmental impact, it makes a difference whether we talk about upland rain fertilized production, whether we talk about lowland swamp production, or whether there is some kind of irrigated rice production system. So we detail the value chain functions. Then we set up the matrix and compare the value chain functions and technical processes um, with five different categories of resources and environmental issues, water, energy, soil, ecosystems, and the climate. And in this matrix, we would um, show two different kinds of impacts. The arrow that is going down is the impact of the value chain on the environment, the type one that we had in the earlier slide, and we would also show the impact of, of the environment on the value chain, the red arrow that is going down. Um, and so that we have the two different main kind of impact that we had in the earlier slide. And now we could have a closer look at the energy uh, arrows that we have here. And we can see in this example, energy obviously just in this example, is not a big issue on primary production, but it's an issue at processing level. And there we have two different systems, parboiling and milling, and both have a negative impact regarding energy and are influenced also in terms of framework um, uh, questions, um, impact of the environment on our value chain. We have these arrows um, and with the next table we will have a closer look at these arrows that we have here and this means that at processing in terms of energy for parboiling there we see an over exploitation of wood and we see air pollution and for milling it's a question of inefficient use of energy and high carbon emissions and both um, technical systems are influenced by type 2 environmental, environmental impact on the value chain 
that there is rising fuel price um, for the power boiling and there is high energy cost uh, that is influencing negatively uh, the competitiveness of milling um, in our value chain. So um, we would use these two tools here, uh, the environmental impact matrix and the table of environmental impact to identify and describe the main points uh, that the main issues, the main concerns that we have, have for our value chain in terms of energy. How does value links actually me measure environmental impacts? And there are a number of tools mentioned in the value links manual, like the carbon footprint analysis or climate proofing. But for a quick evaluation of the environmental impact, a major possibility is to use the so-called hotspot analysis of the Wuppertal Institute for Climate, Environment and Energy. What we present here in, um, in this PowerPoint slide, it's a tool that allows differentiating between problems which are burning hot, the so so-called hotspot, hotspots, or which are less important and not such an urgent burning problem. The main point here is that um, a high intensity of the use of the resource, what we have in the first column as uh, point number a, a, is not a problem per se. It only becomes a problem when the resource is rare. Uh, so we would compare with the hotspot analysis the, uh, on, on the, the intensity of the use of the resource, column A, with column B, the availability of the resource. And uh, to give you an example in terms of energy, let's uh, say we are in a, in a country in the Sahel region and we have a high intensity of the use of firewood in our value chain. And in the Sahel region, the resources are almost depleted in terms of um, wood available. So in, in both cases, high intensity of use and the resources that are almost depleted, we would give it a three, we would multiply it. And if we get a result from the multiplication between six to nine, this would mean there we have a hotspot because of intensity of the use of the resource and the availability of the resource. If we would do the same assessment for high intensity of use of firewood in Germany, um, high intensity of use of firewood would again be three, but our wood resources are not almost depleted. I think um, sustainable wood is largely available. We would multiply it then by one and it would not be a hotspot in Germany. So in the end, this hotspot analysis is a quite mm, practical way uh, to do a qualitative judgment of uh, the severity of the problem. Um, before we continue with energy mapping, before we hand over, I would like to summarize what value links would approach as uh, in general for the assessment of environmental question and particularly uh, for energy. Um, in step one, the value chain map is our starting point for setting up a conceptual model of the interaction between the value chain and the environment. For setting up such a conceptual model, we differentiate uh, between uh, the different technical systems and the different resource categories that we use. In step number two, we identify the main environmental impacts of the value chain, like inefficient use of energy, and we point out to the impact of the environment on the value chain, like rising resource prices. Our main tools here in step number two are the matrix and the list of environmental impacts. And in step number three, we evaluate the severity of the environmental problems, for instance, based on a qualitative hotspot analysis. Um, yeah, and as a result of this assessment, we would then address the priority points, the main priority concerns identified as hotspots and would discuss strategic considerations, how to improve resource efficiency and how to promote green opportunities.
And it says, does the hotspot analysis not rather reflect a subjective judgment than an objective analysis? What does Value Link has to say to that? What do we need to know? In the end, it's something, do we think it's a major impact, it's a medium impact, it's a small impact? Which, what are really the burning problems? It's to a certain extent definitely subjective, but that's also on the other side a bit the charm of the tool. Um, that it allows a rather quick assessment. And uh, this for me is a difference to a much more measurable uh, carbon footprint analysis, but which I find also more difficult for value chain projects. We have our guests today. Important part of the work of powering agriculture is value chain assessments. And in this context, the energy mapping has already also been developed. So what we realized um, in value chain assessment is that there is a high energy consumption for food production and this energy mainly comes from fossil fuels. Additionally, there is very low productivity in agriculture value chain. Um, so this situation um, causes a lot of challenges for farmers, for um, smallholders and also for processors because in many developing countries there is low access to electricity in rural areas and um, fossil fuels are very costly. Um, additionally, there are um, high post-harvest losses um, which even decreases the agricultural productivity. This is oftentimes caused by, for example, by a lack of cooling facilities. So we see there are many challenges um, related to energy aspects along the value chain which call for our attention and um, need to be solved by appropriate solutions. So in general we can say solutions um, should always increase productivity and sustainability of resource use by the promotion of decentralized clean energy solutions. The aim of energy mapping is to give an overview of the different energy sources, the energy intensity and the energy access, including its reliability for each value chain step. This is how a finalized energy mapping should look like or can look like. It's very, um, it depends very much on the users, how an energy mapping looks in the end, but this is um, one example. So in the practice, it could also, also look like this. This is now an example from Cameroon and we see on, on the ground we can also use a pin board and just a few cards and with different colors um, based always on value links methodology. We have chosen here um, for this webinar the grant net value chain um, which uh, in Malawi. Um, in the second step it is important to identify the relevant value chain steps. So um, we note them down on a white arrow shaped um, card. That's in this case, we have input, production, pre-processing and processing. Um, then we come to the third step um, where we need to identify the activities at each value chain steps. We have here um, three differently, um, three different colored cards. We start with the yellow cards, um, which um, mark the actors. Here we have for grant nuts, for example, there are smallholders, cooperative and small and medium enterprises who are active along the value chain. On the orange card, cards, we mark the timing. In the third step, we then um, really define or really analyze the activities. In the first step, we, we, design, um, we define the uh, type of energy that is used for each activity. So we developed icons for that and we uh, marked them in blue. So you see we have um, different types of energy used for, for each activity. That can be one, uh, one type of energy, but for some activities, as for irrigation, for example, we have different types of energies that could be used. It always depends on the farmers, what the energy source for each type of energy used, um, and we mark that with icons on green circles. We have on the left side energy harnessed from sun. We have the grid for electrical um, energy from national or regional utility. We have the fuel that stands for energy from fossilized oil. In the next step, sixth sub-step of the energy mapping, um, we need to identify untapped energy sources. 
So it could be that along the value chain, um, there are um, there is produced um, some type of biomass that could be used in, in further um, future steps. So um, here for ground nuts, we see that we have from shelling, we have leftovers like the shells and from oil pressing. Um, by pressing oil, we, we produce oil cake, which could also be a, pos a potential energy source. In the seventh sub step, we estimate more or less how many percentages of energy are used in each value chain step. Here for ground nuts, we see that most energy, around 75%, is probably used in processing. So that um, also shows us where we can get um, most, most uh, impact, the highest impact out of it. Okay, when we finish this first um, mapping of the current situation, we go to the second sub-step. Um, we do a barrier and opportunity analysis of the um, map value chain. In this step, we analyze the key constraints and challenges, mark them on red cards, and we analyze the opportunities on white cards. So we have few opportunities and challenges for the grant nuts value chain. The opportunities are mainly there uh, where we have um, produced biomass and which we can use as um, energy source. Um, place I would like to zoom into drying um, the challenge um, under the processing step. Um, drying is for ground nuts a very uh, critical um, process because um, moisture content needs to be re reduced. Actually this is done by sun as we can see here we have um, marked sun as energy source and heat is needed for drying um, but Oftentimes, um, sun drying can take a long time, which again increases um, the danger of mold um, and toxic. The third step in the entire mapping process is called data refinement. This is probably not everyone comes to this analysis, I would say. Um, this is if you are at the beginning of a project and um, you really want to dig into uh, the nitty gritty of energy use and the cost of energy along the value chain. That's when you would ask for more, for more quantitative analysis as well. And you need, you, you want some results. This was not a, uh, done in the, in the example Hannah has presented. Um, because for, for this step, we, we suggest that you produce actual values. And for this additional research is evidently required. We have listed some suggested, um, ratios and cost information and other details that you could look into. Uh, this is not a, an exhaustive list. You can do some, you don't need to do all. You, you, you use what you think um, fits, um, fits best. Um, and ideally this could help you, it helps you compare options if you have different options. I mean, if you have uh, figures at the end, it can hopefully help you also take a decision and move on to the the last step, the fourth one, which is again sort of next level, um, uh, where you probably you, you you take stock of what you have already produced. You might not you might not uh, have now any any longer just uh, one pin board full of uh, of cards, but you probably also have done some more intensive uh, research, and you could um, look go back and say again. So, who is actually our target group? Um, what do we want to improve for whom? We need to reassess and adjust. What are the low-hanging fruits? Where should we start? What what is what is easier to do? What is um, uh, who offers what? So we need to do a, probably a more detailed stakeholder analysis to find out who is the technology provider who can increase or develop capacities, uh, um, especially at farm level. How do we how do we go um, how do we go about this? And we also have questions in the chat. I can start with um, the question on how much the quantification of the data do projects need and can do in reality. So in the end, we need um, quantification only when we do uh, data refinement. So for, for the first step of energy mapping, it is, it is about uh, knowing the, um, the different steps of a value chain, knowing what energy sources are used, and um, yeah, finding out where do farmers have problems, so what are the challenges. And um, I think uh, data is then needed when we want to calculate um, how much energy is really used or needed for an appliance. We chose the, the percentage approach 
simply because it allows us to do a little bit more fine tuning. One has to look at these percentages over the whole value chain. Let's assume your value chain um, ends at production, for instance, that after harvesting, all the crops are exported uh, outside the country. Then your percentages would change significantly. Then your input percentage would be possibly at 60% and your production at 40%. So you always look at them in relation and it's just to give you a gut feeling of where can you actually start doing what measures. You know, if you are an energy efficiency project, you will probably focus pretty much on the processing and all the steps before will not be of such relevance to you. Oftentimes, if you speak about a new energy solution, it requires financing. So you need to convince people that changing their way of uh, operating uh, could be replaced and makes sense to be replaced in the, in the long term. And oftentimes, this is a very tricky question to answer now because you need to figure out your, the, the time that you use your uh, energy source uh, and your, um, the appliance for in order to see if, if you can basically get a return on your investment. I was asking for some feedback from our seven countries and what I have heard from them it was very helpful to get like an overall overview about uh, the energy needs along the value chain. One feedback was that the percentage, uh, the percentage indications um, are not divided into subcategories. So this was one feedback and uh, then also be helpful if the industrial processing and the local processing could be uh, could be showcased um, separately from each other. The most relevant recommendation or the biggest recommendation was really to uh, yeah to develop the, the the mapping further in terms of also or I mean in terms of what you have described or what you have named the second phase. Because in that case, when it comes to, when it really integrates those economical aspects and those business aspects, then becomes uh, much more relevant and much more helpful also for projects that are already advanced. Actually, if you do this together with those people who are involved, and the main, with your partners, with the relevant actors of the value chain, then it has the effect that people in the end are standing in front of the pin board and say, oh, wow, I wasn't aware of that, um, of that aspect or of this aspect. If you only do it with a consultant and you do it in, in, in his or her room, the effect will not be the same. You won't have the same awareness afterwards. And um, I think Jennifer also mentioned the point that it's often also not only a thing of um, having the information, but also a, a point of, of um, convincing someone to change habits. And that is only possible if you have the awareness before, if you have been thinking about it yourself and not someone else for you. The tool was designed to be participatory, very much like most of the value links tools. So it lends itself to stand and discuss and pin items and cards up on a pin board, very much like Hannah has described. It can be used by a consultant, but it's, it's um, in, in, as a standalone as well. Um, but the true value is if it is applied participatory. Any feedback there from one person in the audience? The perspective of the sectoral project working on value chains as well. Uh, when it comes to my mind in terms of the feasibility and also the applicability for projects, it's interesting, of course, for energy projects, but when you have other projects on value, working on value chains, um, there are many activities which they have and they have to see if, where they get their resources from. But what you always do, in, as Bastian also mentioned, is the value chain analysis initially. And there you have a part where you focus on the risk. And when you maybe identify energy supply as a risk, then you can integrate the value chain mapping. I think that would be really helpful. And here we could also think about being a bit more precise on where the energy distribution, how it actually looks in figures to make sure that we address the right, um, the right issues when it comes to the negative implications, as it was also mentioned by Matthias Berthold, as energy mapping also focus on uh, maybe where are the challenges. I see your last chart uh, on reflection as most helpful, important questions and aspects for sensitizing on energy issues in the value chain. Perhaps these should be asked much earlier in the process. 
evidently you need to look at who your stakeholders are uh, before you start the whole exercise. I mean, it's not done in a void. So you, you know already uh, uh, who, who you, where you come from. However, you, you might want to kind of at the end sort of open up a little again and, and, and reflect. Uh, so now I have assessed, am I actually with my possible solution in mind, am I addressing the woman? Let's say, am I addressing the poorest of the poor or am I more focusing on the mid-level farmers? Or um, So I guess you need to, to adjust again and uh, just to factor it in as a, uh, as a, as a step, you, or a, po a box you need to check that you are actually uh, achieving what you, what you set out to do. Or is there already experience on how to improve value chains so that they have a positive effect on the environment, on the natural resources? I could have, or I could present one example of a value chain that has a positive effect on the environment. Um, we can see the production of improved cooking stoves to be used um, in households as a value chain itself by promoting the value chain. And, and we have projects working on these improved cooking stoves. By improving this value chain, we would have a positive effect on the environment, natural resources, as we reduce uh, a lot to the consumption of firewood. Let's talk about the future. Um, how do we see this for um, the energy mapping tool? From our side, there is no specific project plan at the moment where to apply energy mapping, but it is a method that can be used by all pro projects that combine agriculture and energy. So where it will be used or where the more detailed, uh, more advanced steps will be used is in the green innovation centers in the different countries because there we did like the first steps. Um, we analyzed the value chain, we see where are challenges, but now I think it's um, it's on the countries or on, on the um, on the people working there to to go more into a detailed analysis um, of the energy aspects. I've been asked to start thinking. Um, in my capacity as a project leader for a sector project um, to think ahead of combining the topics of energy, mechanization and digitalization in agriculture production. This is still, to my understanding, a bit raw, but all I can say to the, uh, to, to the audience here is that my impression is that BMZ is thinking about investing more into these areas. Mechanization is something we've been working on for a couple of uh, um, years now. Uh, energy might be coming further on top and both in connection with digital opportunities in modern agricultural production. That is something I keep hearing over the last six months a bit more frequently. I would like to go back to our initial statements one and two. And I was quite surprised that everybody agreed that we need more tools for assessing energy efficiency and that we need to have m more that it's important for value chain upgrading that everybody agrees this is not nothing that we could expect per se um, it's it's strong it's a strong statement that everybody sees the need and uh, from that uh, point on i would take it this way that i would like to include also one or two slides from this webinar on energy mapping in the generic value links material. So with that words, I would like to close today. Thanks to all the speakers and everyone in the audience and goodbye. Enjoy your day.